I'm Dr. David Ficker from the University of Cincinnati. I'm here with Claude Steriad from the University of Toronto, who's here discussing her research presenting. She's presenting at the AES. So tell us what you're presenting. Uh, so the project that I'm presenting is a project that's been joint between the University of Toronto and the University of Western Ontario in London. Um, it's a project looking at autoimmune epilepsy and specifically at the differences between multiple types of antibodies and whether that relates to a different clinical presentation and different responses to treatment. So we know from the immunology world that antibodies come in multiple shapes and forms. They can be targeting intracellular antigens and those are typically perineoplastic associated with an underlying malignancy that's usually occult at the time of the diagnosis, or they can target the cell surface receptor. And there's multiple examples of that, like an MDA receptor encephalitis is a well-known form, also IGI-1 antibodies, and there's a growing list in each category. Uh, we've known for some time that they cause a variety of neurological syndromes, which can include seizures, but recently we've become aware that epilepsy can be a predominant phenotype uh, that can be associated with these syndromes. And so what we looked at was patients with autoimmune epilepsy who either carried antibodies targeting an intracellular antigen or antibodies targeting a cell surface receptor. So we looked at patients with anti-MA2, which is a protein inside the cell, and anti-LGI1, which is a protein outside the cell. And there are a few things that came about overall patients with anti ma which is inside the cell, tend to have a more malignant, severe clinical course. So they tend to be in the ICU, go into status epilepticus. Their EEG is typically that of multifocal interictal discharges, so a more widespread uh, disease, and they tend to not respond to immunotherapy. And immunotherapy is usually in the com in a combination of steroids, intravenous immunoglobulins, plasma exchange, or rituximab. So really it's immunotherapy that targets the B-cell response mostly, and probably it's because uh, these antibodies are usually T-cell mediated that we don't see a response in these patients. And meanwhile, patients with LGI-1, which we know causes epilepsy when it's mutated, um, in these cases, when there was antibodies to LGI-1, they had a very unusual sort of seizure semiology very often. So they had what we now know as facial brachial dystonic seizures or focal tonic seizures. They also had pilomotor seizures. They had very unusual EEG. It was very frequent subclinical temporal lobe seizures. Uh, and this group responded to immunotherapy quite well in contrast to the patients with MA2. So a lot of the things that arose through this is that patients with intracellular antigens have a very severe malignant clinical course and don't respond to treatment, have early atrophy on their MRI as well, while patients with LGI-1 have usually very suggestive seizure semiology and are much more responsive to immunotherapy. Okay. When would you suggest we check for immune-mediated epilepsy in our patients with seizures? So I think that's not very well understood right now. It used to be that we only checked it in patients who had seizures, who had other syndromic features of limbic encephalitis, so severe cognitive disturbance, severe behavioral disturbance, bilateral mesial temporal hyperintensities. But what's come about in the past couple of years is that there's been a few studies looking at epilepsy cohorts who did not necessarily have these syndromic features, testing these patients for antibodies, and actually unusually high numbers have these antibodies. Uh, it sort of varies from study to study, but in some unselected cohorts of focal drug-resistant epilepsies, up to 10% had this. And so their features were multiple. So they tended to have psychiatric disturbance that was thought to be unusual for a temporal lobe epilepsy, so they tended to have psychosis. They also had more severe than expected cognitive impairment. They had certain types of seizure semiology, so the facial brachial dystonic or focal tonic seizure that we now know about. Um, they also tended to have white matter changes on their MRI. Um, conversely, if they had a normal MRI with a late onset focal epilepsy that arose suspicion, and in the cases where they had a lumbar puncture, CSF oligoclonal banding was suggestive of that. And so the list is probably growing, and part of what we're trying to do here is really examine in detail the patients that we now do know have these antibodies to really see whether there are additional indicative features so that we can really test the patients for whom it will be high yield to look for these antibodies. Okay. Does this study change how you approach patients with with autoimmune epilepsy, those with the intracellular antigens, are, they, are you going to treat them differently? So right now the problem is that we don't have really good immunotherapy treatments right. for these patients. I think the one important thing, which we already know, is that these patients tend to have an underlying malignancy. And so you'll search more uh, intensely for an underlying occult malignancy and keep screening them at least every th three to six months if you don't find that malignancy. 
There may be some more T-cell targeted immunotherapies that may be more effective and there have been a few very small studies in the neuroimmunology world looking at medications like tacrolimus, but this is very preliminary. It's been an, done in other types of neurological syndromes but may need to be explored in patients with autoimmune epilepsy due to these antibodies because we know that our conventional treatments are not effective. What are your next steps for your research? Um, so I think what's important is to continue to recruit more patients with these antibodies. And the other interesting point is that we're discovering more and more of the cell surface receptor antibodies, the ones that do respond to treatment. So in the past year, we've known about GABA-B, GABA-A antibodies. And really, we need to define whether the patients with these antibodies within the cell surface receptor group all behave in the same way or in a different way and how we can differentiate those. And I think the key is really to just accrue, accrue more patients with this disorder, study them better to establish a wider clinical spectrum so that we know in the future where to test uh, these antibodies. Okay. Is there anything else you want to share with us about your research? Um, no, I, it's been really exciting and I think the key here is that I've been really lucky to work with uh, uh, doctors in London, Ontario as well and I think the key here is because this is still considered a rare disease is to do multi-center studies like this one and like many others to try to understand this a little bit better. Okay, thank you. Thank you.